Hello, everyone, and welcome to my session at SDC 2021 on NVMe over fabric protocols and transports, not quite so deep dive. Uh, I'm Joseph White, and I'm a fellow at uh, Dell. And the not quite so deep dive is because I have a, um, I revised my abstract a little bit after I started to produce the session. And originally I was going to be much more expansive and this led to an enormous deck. And I thought it would be better and more concise if I looked at just a little bit of the history of block storage and at what the protocols and transports have in common, and then look at some of the transport properties and behavior trade-offs between NVMe over TCP and NVMe over Rocky. And then I'll use some simplified examples to discuss offload processing in a data processing unit, also known as a smart unit. So a little bit of background is interesting here. I mean, I've been doing this um, work since about 1998, so 23 years now. And if you look at the history of the storage networking uh, protocols and industry, you know, for a long time, all you had was parallel SCSI. And uh, you know, that served fairly well for the systems in the late 80s and early uh, 90s. And you know, NAS was around then, but I'll focus on block storage, uh, storage area networks. In the late 90s, you saw the rise of fiber channel. And fiber channel is interesting because it's gone through about eight major upgrades with um, many shelf feet of specification. And it's still around today and still quite popular uh, for storage networking. In the late 90s and early 2000s, you also had a couple of other phenomena come up. So you had several switch to network parallel SCSI approaches. Um, there was you know, SCSI over Ethernet, and there was you know, MFCP and IFCP uh, that were proposed and produced, and a few other kind of early IP Ethernet-based transports. You also saw the rise of iSCSI, um, to, and what, and then finally, finally FCOE. iSCSI again is uh, still in use today, as is FCOE. Um, and what all of these things have in common is that they're um, they're basically carrying SCSI command formats in one form or another, and uh, Fiber Channel. Uh, still can do that with FCP. What happened in the mid 2010s is NVMe over fabric um, arose out of the PCIe definition for NVMe. Uh, local flash drives uh, started appearing. They started to become cost effective in a, in a much cleaner, more straightforward, more performant protocol was needed. NVMe was created for that. Um, and pretty soon people said, well, we should network this. So created NVMe over fabric standards. Um, and that has been mapped to a variety of transports, including Rocky, TCP, Fiber Channel, InfiniBand, and iWarp. And it's picking up steam and popularity. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the NVM Express Standards Organization. And we should see a, you know, fairly wide expansion of adoption of various forms of NVMe over fabric uh, accelerating over the next three, uh, few years. So analyst reports are showing uh, considerable growth across all of the protocols. And um, you know, in particular, NVMe over TCP is expected to really uh, pick up. So what do all these protocols have in common? Well, their core purpose is to transfer data uh, from one system to another across a network or fabric or issue commands to a system. So I want to basically put the system in a certain state or to tell it to do something related to block storage, or I want to do a read or a write command and, and move data one direction or the other uh, between systems. Typically, this is a, a server to a storage device, but it doesn't strictly have to be that. Now, NVMe over fabric says, hey, 
we've got hosts and subsystems and the host transfers to and from the subsystems. And that cleans up some of the other, you know, some of the protocol things. It means if you want bi-directional communication, you have to be both a host and a subsystem. Um, and all of these protocols and in the way they transfer data have the commands and transfers broken into packets with an end-to-end -end protocol on top of a transport protocol. So there's a protocol by which you exchange the commands and the data. And then there's a transport protocol that moves the bytes across the network from one system to another. They all have a method for sequencing commands and allowing multiple commands. Even uh, Parallel SCSI had that, you know, different kinds of QDEPs or, uh, you know, parallel paths, or there's a whole variety of things there. Um, Within the communicating systems, the, the actual endpoints are typically logical or virtualized on top of the hardware. You know, you don't talk about this ethernet port talking to that ethernet port in terms of the upper level protocol. It's usually a uh, host um, initiator talking through an interface that's likely virtualized to a controller on a subsystem that's hiding the details of the actual physical layout of the block storage. Um, this is valuable because it lets you abstract and virtualize at uh, a number of layers and present um, you know, services and uh, thin provisioning and, and logical volumes and all the good things that you need out of you know, enterprise quality uh, storage systems. Um, and then most of these protocols have some notion of a set of services, controllers, or orchestrators that are used to manage the systems and uh, their connections. Uh, and then finally, there's a set of admin or control commands that are in band to assist with discovery, connection setup, and operations. So when you act, so what we're going to do is focus on how things are transported. And I'm not going to go into every protocol detail here. Instead, I'm going to focus on kind of the overview and the commonality, and then talk about two of the predominant flavors of actually transporting the data. So if we look at SAN packet examples, um, what we see is that you always have addressing, sequencing, control, QoS, some way to do tunneling or encapsulation, so you can jump fabrics or isolate an overlay from an underlay. There's codes that identify the type of packets or the next header, and there are a number of names for these things. And then there's the payload, which will carry the commands, the data, some status information, some other control bits. There's typically a form of uh, data integrity. So, you know, CRCs are checksums, so you know that nothing's been accidentally altered in the packet. And then there's typically a data confidentiality and a tamper resistance, so um, a, a capability. And so this is to know no one's messed with your packet deliberately and uh, so that no one can see the contents of your packet if you set that up. And you can see in the fiber channel example, um, you know, I've got uh, SID and DID, destination and source IDs to control uh, where packets go. I've got um, the ability to put a, a virtual fabric tag or some encapsulation header or interfabric routing, which never really got used much, but it was a, an interesting protocol. Um, you know, I have uh, OX and RX IDs that tell me which exchange these things belong to, which communication they belong to. And then you, you, know, you have a payload. If we look at a couple of other examples, again, you can see the commonality. FCOE moved um, uh, essentially fiber channel frames with uh, Ethernet encapsulation. So it's an inherently layer two protocol uh, for the Ethernet segment. And so you have an Ethernet header, an FCOE header uh, to tell you, hey, I've got a fiber channel header immediately coming so that the uh, forwarding uh, pipelines can do their job and send the packets to the correct place. If you look at iSCSI, it's, you know, it, I, I show the IPv4 example, or it could be IPv6. This is a traditional Ethernet IPv4 uh, TCP. And, and then there's a 
uh, typically a, a payload that has um, a number of commands. And iSCSI is a stream protocol, so not all frames will line up exactly like this. I'll explain that more in the context of NVMe over TCP. So finally, we come to NVMe over Fabric. As I said earlier, we've got uh, a variety of uh, protocol encapsulations, and the, the possible stacks are, are, are quite complex. Um, but there are common properties for NVMe OF, right? Common command formats, multiple uh, command sets, so multiple mappings, uh, multiple transport mappings, rich discovery and connection setup, efficient read or write command formats. And then there's a notion of lots of, or the capability for lots of key pairs for concurrency and multiple outstanding commands. So let's look at the two, two of the more uh, uh, prevalent versions of encapsulation. So the first one's uh, NVMe over Rocky V2. Here we have an Ethernet header, an IP header, which is a UDP header, and I'll show more details on, on that part of the uh, protocol uh, coming up here. And then we have a full InfiniBand uh, header and payload inside. So I'm doing RDMA uh, using RDMA verbs, and uh, that encapsulates the NVMe inside the InfiniBand payload. So what this is, is it's a tunnel or a wrapper for InfiniBand RDMA commands. And that has some you know, nice advantages and some, um, you know, some disadvantages, some interesting trade-offs, uh, especially with using UDP as a transport. Because UDP as a transport basically requires um, Ethernet uh, to be lossless, and that's typically done with either link over flow control or priority flow control. Okay, so now let's look at a little bit about NVMe over TCP, and then we'll get into uh, uh, you know an example and and do the contrast between them. So NVMe over TCP has a um, an encapsulation shown on the left to form a protocol data unit header, a PDU header, and then there's a a PDU payload which is the the contents or the data that's being transported. And I have, if I have a stream of those, they're, they're, they can be placed um, in the TCP packets in arbitrary fashion. So think of a set of commands and their data as just a, a byte stream, and it gets chopped up arbitrarily into TCP segments, which have IP headers on them. And so there's no particular uh, alignment relationship between the carried uh, PDUs and uh, the, the, the packets you would see on the wire. But it can, with it, because it's TCP, it can run over either lossy or lossless networks equally. Okay, so, so let's peel back one more and I'm not gonna go do a deep dive on either uh, UDP or TCP, but I do want to point out sort of the top level differences. So UDP is a straightforward datagram protocol. It's connectionless, no guaranteed delivery, no flow control mechanisms. What that means in practice is um, I encapsulate the data I want to send in a UDP header and I push it onto the network and it goes to the destination IP at the des and the destination uh, UDP port number, and there, if there's a listener on that, it'll push the packet up to the application that's registered to handle that port or the thread of execution or the kernel area that's registered to handle that port, and you have your datagram and you, you work on the data. With TCP, it's a little more complex in that it's a byte stream protocol that's connection oriented with guaranteed delivery and flow controls built into the protocol. So you have to handle the windowing, you know, there's a, a window you can send into, there's a sender's congestion window, there's sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. Uh, the guaranteed delivery means you have to get an acknowledgement back before you can forget about the data on the transmitting side. Uh, the receiver has to actually send that acknowledgement back. There's a whole variety of retransmission protocols and ways in which you slow down with 
you know, fast retransmit thought with combined congestion avoidance, um, retransmission timeout, also known as slow start. So there's a lot of stuff going on in uh, TCP. But again, fundamentally, I've got um, a byte stream that I chop into uh, packets and put on the wire. Okay, so let's discuss the consequences of these two approaches with a simplified example. Okay. In the datagram example, let's suppose a host wants to read uh, three chunks of data, data one, data two, data three, into buffer one, uh, two, and three. So this would be an example of uh, uh, using uh, NVMe over Rocky. Um, and the packets that go out have network headers, which are green, and protocol headers, which are brown. And you send your, your read data commands out. And what comes back is a sequence of packets where I have a, a network header and a protocol header on every packet. And if things have to be broken up, um, it's no big deal. You just get additional uh, protocol headers. Um, and it's, very, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the um, RDMA has uh, set up the buffering such that the data can be DMA'd or placed directly into the buffers. And uh, you know, this protocol works quite, quite well, but any drops have to be recovered at kind of the command and upper level protocol layer. So again, as I said before, you don't want drops on this one. Um, the other example would be using you know, NVMe over TCP. And there I might have one packet with three commands in it. So I've got three protocol headers, three commands that say read data one, read data two, read data three. The subsystem returns the data as a byte stream. So there are protocol headers that get spread across the packets and data can be broken up um, in uh, arbitrary ways. Um, and the sys so the so the subsystem has to walk through the command packets to uh, get each read data command. And then the host has to wait for the second packet before it can deal with all of data too. Um, with zero copy TCP, you can still DMA the data into a buffer. So you can get sort of equivalent behavior there. And there's a consequence though, if I dropped the first packet, uh, the one that has data one and the first part of data two in it, um, I wouldn't know what to do with the second packet because it just starts with data. There's no header, there's no nothing. And I've lost track of where I am in the sequence. So I have to wait for that first packet to uh, arrive before I can handle the second packet. Whereas in the datagram example, I can handle each packet in order because I know where it's supposed to go based on the header in that packet. So that's sort of the, 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 the trade-off between the two. Now, what I want to point out is the, the commonality again. In each case, the commands and the data transfer, transferred or are the same. So there's no difference in, no meaningful difference in sort of total overhead. Um, there's no real fundamental difference in uh, number of packets. Uh, they can, you know, both protocols can use jumbo frames. Um, both protocols uh, have to, uh, you know, chop the data up if it exceeds the, the size of a single frame. Um, so there's not really a, an inherent advantage or disadvantage from the point of view of the commands and data themselves. So finally, I want to talk about the implications of this for uh, data processing units or smart NICs and protocol acceleration. So uh, a data processing unit has five um, functional blocks at its base. It's got a PCI interface to the host. It's got ARM cores with DRAM or high bandwidth memory. It's got protocol acceleration pipelines. So it's got embedded cores or um, you know, P4 pipelines or uh, hard 
you know, hard coded blocks that can deal with various kinds of offload. It has security and support accelerators. So if I want, you know, TLS encryption or uh, IPsec encryption, I can get that in band and uh, in line in the hardware. And then finally, it's got a network interface. Typically, you see two to eight ports. Um, those are increasing over time. That can do embedded switching, network, traditional network packet processing, you know, filters and policers and those sorts of things. Um, it does the forwarding lookup. And then it also has uh, NIC functions uh, so that the, the, the host uh, says, oh, I have a NIC at this SRIOV address. Ah, I know how to deal with that. And if you look at where it sits within a server, um, it sits in the position a NIC would sit, but it's much more capable. It can do uh, direct access to other PCI devices, persistent memory, GPUs, NVMe over fabric. It can also do DMAs into and out of the uh, x86 CPU's uh, DRAM. And again, strictly, it doesn't have to be an x86, and the DPU doesn't strictly have to have ARM cores, but this is just what we see typically. And then it's allowed to have a sideband interface to a, a, a BMC, a, 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 base, a baseboard controller. Okay. So what can you do with a DPU in terms of protocol acceleration? Well, you can support dedicated NVMe over fabric processing in hardware pipelines. This means that you're offloading your x86 cores and not requiring your kernel to do that work. Um, typically, an offload processing can, can be done much more efficiently, both in terms of power and latency and throughput. Um, the DPU can directly place or send data uh, from the to or from the host DRAM via DMA, and it can also operate uh, across PCI, PCIe to local devices. So I could expose um, my NVMe drive out to the network uh, through the DPU, for example. Both TCP and RDMA Rocky transports can be offloaded. So both of them can be offloaded. The accelerators and pipelines must be constructed correctly to match the transport. So as we saw in the diagram before, there are differences in the way the transport is executed and the requirements on the network, but there's no core limitation or core problem with doing the acceleration. And you just have to take into account the way the transports move the commands and data. And, and that's really my core conclusion here is that this set of differences in the transports matters in terms of how you do the implementation, but you can get effective performance out of both transports depending on how your system and your offloads are built. That concludes my um, shortened presentation and hopefully it was uh, interesting, entertaining, and uh, to the point. And so thank you very much. And please take a moment uh, to rate this session.